Amen. You guys are going to have to excuse me. I'm, I apologize. I normally never have a cough drop or gum in when I'm talking, but this stuff will not let my throat go. And so I'm going to have a cough drop in this morning because I feel like I'm about ready to lose my voice a little bit. So please forgive me for that if I'm fiddling with it and it's annoying. It's not really what I want to do, I promise. Okay? Amen? Amen. Well, today I get the opportunity to continue our series on the ordinary made extraordinary. And I selfishly took three people at once. Because for, for me, I felt like when, the, when we were sitting here, we were throwing this thing around. I think it was back in December. You know, this was what came to my heart and my mind. Three guys um, of very significant importance. Um, three guys that are mentioned multiple times in the Bible together. Um, but also three guys I don't think that sometimes we give enough credit to as a whole together. And I think we like to focus on one of them or two of them or at a time, and we forget how intertwined the big three really were. And I'm going to tell you who those guys are in a second, but I'm going to start by telling you that I'm a huge fan of sports. I'm just saying right now I am. I grew up, and it may shock people to think this, and the kids in my school freak out when I tell them this, but for the better part of my entire life I played basketball. I know that I've coached football for 15 years now, and I've intermingled into basketball. It's hard for kids to understand that. I lived and breathed basketball. I loved it. I loved every second of it. I used to watch, I used to watch the Bulls games on WGN, on the old cable, Channel 9. I'd tune in for that every night I could. I'd watch that game. I don't hardly ever watch basketball anymore. It's hard for me to watch. I throw it out there. My kids love it. Marty Joe loves it. In fact, for his birthday, neighbor's birthday, we're going to try to go to a Memphis Grizzlies game. You know what I'm saying? It's great, but it's hard for me to watch. But when I was growing up, I ate that up, man. ESPN Classic used to show the old 70s and 80s basketball games. Loved every second of it. I love getting into debates with the kids in my school about who the greatest player of all time is. It's Michael Jordan. Don't at me. Just throwing that out there. I've got statistics to prove it. Don't come at me with LeBron James, please. Don't start with me. Okay? But the big three is this 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 uh, this statement that's been thrown out there. And really, it started with the Miami Heat. Right? Because LeBron James had the decision. And he took Chris Bosch down to with Dwayne Wade. And they set up this super team in Miami. And they were gonna win not one, not two, not three. They made this huge statement about what they were, and that wow, you know, this is the greatest team that's ever played. It's so awesome, right? Well, then we had another team, the Warriors, right, who drafted some players and eventually got a mercenary and Kevin Durant who came in, and they were then the big three, right? But this is not some new thing. People forget that the first big three was probably the Celtics, right? Kevin McHale, Larry Bird, Robert Parrish. Right? And maybe even in that we could intertwine the Lakers from the 80s too, right? So many great players that played for the Showtime Lakers in the 80s. But like I've already kind of alluded to, the real first big three was Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and Dennis Rodman. It just is what it is, guys. So this is not some new thing. And the thing I think about too as I was preparing for this sermon, yeah, I'm talking about the big three. And it's easy to make that transition to sports and all those things. You know, three is a holy number. So it's seven, so it's ten. These are things, it's not, a, it's not some um, coincidence, I believe, that the people we're going to talk to about today, that Jesus selected three people. And the big three we're going to talk about today are Peter, James, and John. Three... Um, instrumental individuals in the perpetuation of the New Testament church following the ascension of Jesus Christ. And sometimes, and this is just me, I'm going to speak personally, it's easy to focus on Peter. Peter was this loudmouth me, essentially, right? And I could have done an ordinary, made extraordinary on just Peter, right? But it would have really limited the idea of how important James and John were also. And sometimes we forget about James and John. Because Peter is this larger than life figure in the New Testament. 
But these three guys were instrumental in what became the New Testament church. And in my thought was, if we're going to do an ordinary and make extraordinary over one of these guys, it needs to be all three. Because they will be forever linked in biblical history together. Forever. Forever, forever. So let's take a look at these ordinary guys being made extraordinary. You know, they are called. They were called by Jesus. In fact, these were the first of the three disciples ever called by Jesus. Not an accident. And they were doing, at the time, probably the most common job available. They were fishermen. I mean, honestly, you live on a sea, that's probably the most common occupation you could probably have at that time. Right? You were born, your dad was a fisherman, he took you out on the boat, you learned how to fish, and that's what you did for the rest of your life. Now, I'm not going to say, it. I was really thinking about this when I was preparing this, I don't want to call anybody else common in here. That's not my intention. Okay? I'm not saying if you're a fisherman, you're a schmuck. Okay? You're some common dude. I'm just saying that they were just everyday guys, okay, of very low education, okay. They probably stunk a fish every day, and they just were hardworking guys. Anybody know any hardworking guys and gals that we would just say do a common job every day, right? They weren't these highly educated individuals. Paul was. Paul was a highly educated person. There's lots of highly educated people. The greatest thing about this sermon series is, is to be able to highlight all the different types of people that God made extraordinary. Isn't that amazing when you think about, like I thought about two weeks ago when Pastor Marty talked about um, the individual, the lady, and she gets, Rahab, she gets mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. How amazing is that? That's unreal, right? Some common prostitute living in a town gets mentioned as a part of the genealogy of Jesus. And these guys are no different. Let's look at Matthew 4, 18 to 22. Verse 18 says, As Jesus walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And once they left their nets and followed him, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were both they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I mean, a lot of times, we've, some of us have probably read this, some of us have probably even heard this as used as a part of a sermon. Probably even some of the things I'm going to bring up have been brought up. Do you know how powerful it was for them just to leave their dad standing there? Anybody here ever work with their dad? Raise your hand. Anybody work with their dad outside? I mean, seriously, it's not easy, right? I mean, can you imagine you're outside? You're building a wall or something, you're, you're shoveling gravel, and some guy just shows up, and Adam just looks at Randy and be like, peace, Dad, I'm out of here. You had to shovel the rest of that by yourself. And by the way, I'm probably not going to be back ever. You know what I mean? Think about this. In Jewish history, in the Jewish family unit, once the parents got too old, it was the children's job to take and take care of the parents. These guys just left. These common, ordinary, everyday individuals answered the call that they were given and followed Jesus. That's a powerful thing. I also want to make a couple notes just so you guys know in case you don't know this. Yes, Peter's name is really Simon, just so you know. James and John are, are all, often considered and referred to as the brothers of thunder, in case you guys didn't know that also. Okay, so just so you hear that. There's a Gospel of John in which John ref refuses to refer to himself as his own name. He writes as himself as the disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved. So when you read John and you hear that, he's referring to himself, but he won't even exalt his own name in the Gospel. There's all these different little tweaks here for these three guys that's pretty amazing. There's also another James, James the brother of Jesus, who eventually becomes converted afterwards. Not the James we're talking about here. See, there's a lot of these names that become intertwined. These guys became special individuals because of their walk with the Lord. So let's look at what makes or how does this exchange from this ordinary fisherman to eventually becoming people that go out 
and essentially establish the church as we know it today? Well, it was pretty simple. Jesus basically selected these three guys, and he took them into his inner circle, and he showed them things he didn't show anybody else on purpose. It was not accidental. Jesus was intentionally discipling these three guys for a reason, and we're going to talk about that reason at the end. But let's take a look at um, where these big three are associated with together and no other disciples. Let's look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 50. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for Peter, James, and John. It was probably a little harder for Peter. If you read all the Gospels, Peter liked to insert foot in mouth multiple times. Peter struggled with that throughout the majority of his walk with Jesus. And it's so funny, I think sometimes we read the Gospels and we think to ourselves, well, I wouldn't be like Peter. Yeah, okay. Okay, whatever. You know, I'd be Peter. I guarantee it. I'd say stupid things. There's a one point in time, Peter even like almost rebukes Jesus for saying something. Don't ever say that again, Jesus. You should never say that. After he just got done calling him the Son of God. Right? So it took some time. It took some working on these guys for them to be able to really understand who Jesus really was. So let's look at this first story, Luke chapter 8. Just so you guys know, this guy has shown up to Jesus because his daughter is deathly ill. That's the backstory here. He's shown up. He needs Jesus to take care of his daughter because she is dying. Okay? And in the middle of this conversation, a guy walks up to this guy and says, Hey, don't bother the teacher. Your daughter has already died. She's dead. So that's the backstory that we kind of get dropped in here in verse 50. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in ex- with him except for who? Peter, James, and John, or Peter, John, and James. And the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Amen? Can you imagine somebody telling you, hey, just relax, she's just sleeping? Many people would chuckle and laugh. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned at once. She stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Patrick talked about Lazarus last week. Lazarus was very public. A public declaration, really, of Jesus showing really whom he was, right? But in this instance, he takes Peter, James, and John aside personally to show them. Do you think that had an impact on those three guys? To see that happen by themselves in that situation? How about Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 3? After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before him. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. This is where Jesus officially shows these three guys that he is exactly who Peter has declared to be the Son of God. But again, he didn't show all 12, just Peter, James, and John. In fact, Peter has a great idea afterwards because Elijah and Moses show up, right? And in Jewish history, they're probably the two greatest individuals besides David and the Messiah, right? And they're there, and they can physically see them, and they can physically see that Jesus is no longer in his earthly form. His face is shining like the light, all these things that makes it really a, a back to the Moses when the burning bushes shows up and you hear the voice of God. Can you imagine thinking to yourself, you're these three, these three guys, you probably have a pretty good idea, maybe arbitrarily, that, hey, this guy, Jesus, yeah, Peter said he's the son of God, he's the Messiah, he's all these things, yes, we've seen him do these miracles, and now all of a sudden you're seeing this guy and he's no longer a human. He's no longer in his human form anymore. And then on top of that, two people you've probably been taught about your entire life, Elijah and Moses, just show up in that form also. They were so freaked out that if you keep reading, they essentially, the three guys, especially again led by Peter, decide, hey, we should build a tabernacle here. 
And you guys can just stay here. And we'll come, and us 12 will worship you. That had an impact on these three guys. So now they see him raise somebody from the dead, along with all the other miracles that Jesus has done in front of everybody else. They've seen him show himself for who he truly is. And let's go to Matthew 26, 36 to 39. In his most vulnerable state, Jesus again takes only Peter, James, and John with him at the end. So you see them there at the beginning. They are filtered through all four Gospels together with Jesus. And then at the very end, when it's about ready to be over with and done, Peter, James, and John are the ones that are asked to go stand guard or stand vigil with Jesus. Verse 36 to 39, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to them, sit here for a while while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are who? James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Remember, and really what he was asking them was, hey, come over here beside me and pray with me. Pray for me. I'm troubled. Now, he's been telling them for a while now he's going to be killed. He's going to be resurrected. In fact, just that night they had the meal, and he told them all again. This is what's going to happen. And now Jesus understands it is the night. This is the night that is going to begin. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Pray with me. Be with me, my friends. You three guys who I have kept so close for the last three and a half years, Just be here with me. Man, does that not show the humanness of Jesus in that position? How he was completely human, but also completely God. As a human, the suffering and the trouble he was going to, because he knew the suffering he was going to take on, he wanted to do what? He wanted his friends to be there with him. To share that with him. To keep watch with him. To pray with him. To pray for him. Going a little farther, he fell to his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. All three of these experiences, as Peter, James, and John experienced closely with Jesus, changed who they were. Not just these three experiences, but these three were special. And it's a special place why Jesus would take these guys away to show them these three things. And they now start to transition away from these common, ordinary fishermen into extraordinary men that the Lord saw them as standing on the beach in Galilee. That's the other thing I think about, too. As Jesus selected these guys, and then he selected them to be part of their inner circle, Jesus already knew who they could be if they made those choices. They made the choices to follow him and do those things. He understood who they were going to be. But Peter, James, and John didn't know that. They were just taking every step as it came. They made mistakes along the way, just like we all ordinary people make those mistakes. But eventually, they allowed these steps to um, shape them, to mold them into something that was really bigger than themselves. So what is the result for Peter, James, and John? Fishermen that live with Jesus for three years who then become extraordinary. Without Peter, James, and John, the New Testament church would have never existed. Did you guys all hear that? I'm not saying the other disciples of the 11 were not important. I'm just telling you right now, if you read the first 12 chapters of Acts, 1 through 12, it would have been impossible for the New, New Testament church to exist without Peter, James, and John. It would have failed utterly. In fact, if you read the first 12 chapters of Acts, it's easy to forget because Paul gets highlighted a lot, especially in the last chapters of Acts, right? And if you look in the back of your Bible, you've got these maps, and it shows all the missionary journeys of Paul. And Paul is great. I'm not trying to downgrade Paul in any shape or form here in this place. But people forget the first 12 chapters of Acts were reserved for Peter, James, and John. And specifically, Peter and John. 
fact, you really want to read through those first 12 chapters this week and just note to yourself how many times you hear those three names or a combination of those three names through the first 12 chapters. Highlight them in your Bible. See what they're doing. See how they are appointing um, missionaries. See how they're appointing disciples. See how they are operating as the leadership of the New Testament church. See how Peter and John are arrested. See how Peter and John stand up and say, you can kill me if you want to. I'm going to keep preaching about Jesus. You can kill me. I'm good with that. See how Peter heals people. See how they have an impact on what's going on. When Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians, a false teacher had told the Galatians that in order to follow Christ, they needed to follow the Mosaic Law. This is the opposite of what Paul had been teaching them. In order to prove that he was right to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to teach that they didn't need to follow the law to be saved, Paul appealed to the apostles, particularly three apostles, Peter, James, and John. Paul vindicated himself and his place and what he was doing by telling the people that, hey, I've got the approval of who? Not just Jesus, but I'm under the covering and I've been appointed by these three guys. Peter, James, and John. So let's look at um, Galatians chapter 2, 7 through 9. I'm going to read this part for you so you can see that Paul is referencing these three guys. So it's not just in the Gospels. It shows you the importance of these three men. On the contrary, they recognize that I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, the uncircumcised of the Gentiles. Just as Peter had been to the circumcised. Fundamentally, after the, where the church was founded, Peter mostly focused on the Jews. That's who he was, his focal point was on the Jewish people. Paul was focused on the Gentiles, or everybody else not considered the Jews. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, also, was also at work in me, as an apostle to the Gentiles, James, Cephas, who is Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me, Barna, me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and to the uncircumcised. Galatians 2, chapter 7 through 9. Paul's trying to tell these guys, this guy is teaching you this stuff. It's not right. I'm trying to give you the truth. You don't have to follow the Mosaic law anymore. Jesus became the final sacrifice that took care of all that for us. And in case you maybe just don't believe me because I'm just a guy who's shown up with this guy named Barnabas, I'm telling you, you want to get in contact with the pillars of our church, Peter, James, and John got my back. They have sent me here to do this. So again, it shows the immense amount of importance placed upon these three guys so what did they do let's talk about just in general according to church history not even including just in the bible because you know guys in case you guys don't know this there have been multiple historians that have written about the bible and biblical people we know that are foundational materials if these are being taught in major universities around the world and have been forever these are things and sources that have been checked and triple checked, quadruple checked by people that are in the academic community that only go further to show the accuracy of the Bible. They're not canonical books and we don't read these things. I'm just going to be honest. I don't think any of us would want to pick up you know, some of these histories that have been written and read the whole thing. But they reference individuals as you go through here and they reference what they did after and what they did and how they died. Because some of those things aren't recorded in the Bible. They are recorded by Roman scholars, Roman historians, things of that nature for us. So we need to understand these guys went from fishermen to walking with Jesus to being the pillars on which the New Testament church was created. And they went out and did something for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they had been part of that inner circle. They had been transformed. They were no longer ordinary. Now they were extraordinary in the eyes of man. That's uncomfortable. i got to believe that Peter, James, and John were probably pretty uncomfortable with the position they would be put in. That's probably why John wrote his gospel and refused to use his own name. 
He didn't want to be elevated above Jesus. In fact, I'm going to say, probably all the people that we talk about, like Paul and those guys, would be embarrassed because of the way we elevate their name and their, who they are. They wouldn't want them to be the center of what we're talking about. They wouldn't want who to be the center of what we're talking about. Jesus and the amazing work that they did in their life. James, the brother of John, he was a local missionary. That's what he did. He stayed in Judea and was a mission, missionary to the Jews along with Peter. That's what he was. He spoke boldly about Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah that was promised to the Jewish people, and that we had crucified him, he died, he was buried, and he raised himself again from the dead. And now he sits at the right hand of Father God. That's what James did following the ascension of Jesus Christ. He became a pillar of the New Testament church. James, the brother of Jesus, became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Don't confuse those two people. Eventually, James becomes the first disciple martyred for his faith. In Acts chapter 12, verse 2, it says, It was that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. He chopped his head off. James was a local missions-minded individual for his community here. And he loved Jesus so much, he was willing to preach that word to the people around him in his local area to the point of death. From the histories we know, James was the first disciple martyred for his faith. He refused to bend. What does that look like here for us? Well, what is our local community? Does anybody here feel called to local missions here in our community? That would be Palmyra, Quincy, Hannibal, Marion County, the whole thing. That's what James would have done. James would have been focused here on our local missions of reaching the people here closest to us. So that's James, probably the most forgotten of all the disciples from the big three. Especially, mostly confused with James, the brother of Jesus. So what about John? Tertullian, a Christian writer in the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries, he's a, he's a historian, wrote that before the Romans banished John, and John was around Jerusalem a lot too, okay? They brought him into a coliseum and dunked him in a vat of boiling oil. This is also supported by Roman historians, just so you guys are all aware. Because this was the point in time where the persecution from Rome started coming down. Romans had had enough. And Romans had had enough specifically because Peter, James, and John, and Paul had had an impact on enough people's lives that people were turning to Jesus. And it was having a negative impact on the Roman Empire is what it was happening. So they needed to snuff this thing out if they could. So they just started bringing Christians in the Colosseum. That's what they did. To set a, a statement and a tempo for the people in Rome and around the world because they were the world at that point in time, Rome was. Okay? They were saying the clear message. If you want to be with Jesus, you're going to die. And we're going to help you get there faster. We're going to send you out in the Colosseum with no weapons and we're just going to release lions and tigers and see who wins. We're going to send you out there with a the weapon against these gladiators that are trained killers. And we're all going to cheer and enjoy the spectacle. And John, who is essentially, again, one of the three pillars of the church at this time, gets drug out in the middle of the Colosseum. Can you imagine being this, this situation? I think about like a football game. We're going back to the sports. And you got all these people in the gym. And you got this vat of boiling oil in the middle. And they're all there to watch this guy be boiled alive. That was what they wanted to see. They wanted that. That's why they paid their admission. And Tertullian says they dunked John, put him in, boiling hot oil, and John emerged unharmed. And he said in that moment, every individual in the Colosseum that was there that had paid money converted to Christianity. In that moment. In fact, they even tried to poison him. They made him drink poison. And it still wouldn't kill him. At some point, you would think John was probably like, man, just, it's okay, Jesus. You could take me. Right? I'm okay. You know? They couldn't kill him. 
So to try to limit his impact, because trying to kill him was doing the opposite of what they really wanted. They wanted to erase him. They couldn't. So they just banished him to an island called Patmos. And that place, he continued just to do the Lord's work. He fished. He went back to doing what he knew he could do. And he was an old man at this point in time. And eventually Jesus shows up and reveals the revelation to him. Can you imagine that feeling? (laughs) Sitting in a cave, hanging out. You got no more friends. You're just stuck on this island. There's other people there, but they don't really know you. I mean, can you imagine if you're probably missing your friends, James and John, Jesus, and he just shows up. And you write the last book of the canonical Bible right now. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing stuff. Eventually, he died of old age. That's what John did. He was eventually returned to mainland, what we call Asia Minor now, and passed away at an old age. What about Peter? Peter eventually went from just inside of Jerusalem, and he began then to make trips through what we would call Asia Minor and the No World also. He became a missionary first to his local church, but then he began to go out and do all these things. And not shockingly, Jesus, Jesus said he was going to found the church, his church, on Peter, this rock, right? And Peter and Paul didn't get along all the time. You read those parts of the Bible too, right? The people don't always get along, right? But eventually Peter and Paul accepted who they were for each other. And what's crazy is they both almost meet the exact same fate at the hands of people. And they both go out into the known world and begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter saw, probably knew, um, again, he knew James had been killed. You know, John has been imprisoned and persecuted all the time as Peter's traveling around doing all these things. You know, eventually Peter ends up in Rome under the emperor Nero, who was um, a huge uh, proponent of killing the Christians. In fact, he burned Rome to the ground to blame the Christians, in case you guys didn't know that, just so they would get more public support for the killing of the Jews. And eventually, Peter's brought before Nero and told that you're going to die, we've had enough, and Peter says, that's fine. You're going to crucify me, crucify me up down, upside down because I don't want to be crucified. I'm not worthy to be ended in the same way as my Lord. And that's what they did. They crucified Peter upside down. Imagine the pain of crucifixion anyway, but then being turned upside down, watching all the blood run to your head until you eventually die. These guys became extraordinary, not because of the way they died, but because of the way they lived and the unbending uncompromising way in which they perpetuated the idea that Jesus Christ was the only way, the truth, and the life, and that no man may come to the Father except through Him. They perpetuated that in such a way that they became a danger to the establishment. Can you imagine, did they ever in their wildest dreams believe, standing on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, fishing with their parents, could have ever believed that someday they would stand in the presence of kings, in the presence of emperors, that they would be publicly executed for all those things, but they would ever be given that type of a platform and voice based on a simple carpenter from Nazareth. And that they answered the call. They are willing to live with Jesus, to hear Jesus, and then were willing to never bend for Jesus up until the point of even their own deaths. They became extraordinary, guys. They became extraordinary. You look at like heroes of the Bible or whatever you want to talk, call all these people. They became heroes of the Bible. In fact, those three guys plus Paul really become the story of the New Testament. That's who they are. And they were willing to go out to own what Jesus had given them and to make an impact in the world for him. Amen? My question to you, are you ordinary enough to become extraordinary? Because all the people we've talked about in this sermon series, I don't know how many weeks we're into this thing, but we're probably nearing the end, somewhere in that area. I don't know, we had 12 weeks. Are you ordinary enough 
Or do you see yourself as somebody that the God, that Lord could take from being just a simple teacher, a simple student, a simple whatever, and be made into something extraordinary through living with him? Because that's what Jesus really wants from all of us. Not that we want some grandiose idea. Really, Jesus has already called all of us. Just like he called the three. His desire is that we live with him. In communion with him. Not just on Sundays, but every day. That we would live in a relationship with him. That we would allow him to have an impact on our lives. And begin to transform us into something greater than what I am now. And we don't know what that looks like. Maybe I'm just going to be James. Maybe James, and that's okay. Maybe I'm just going to be James. And I'm going to, this is my job, and God's given me the opportunity to be this local missions. Maybe that's what God wants from me, to have an impact here locally. Maybe God wants us to be John and, and Peter. Maybe he wants us to go out. Maybe he wants us to be traveling the state, traveling the tri-state area. You never know. I know this, God's plans for us are usually so much bigger than what our own plans are for ourselves. And it makes me think about, there's a scene in uh, Evan Almighty, and God, Morgan Freeman, is sitting on this huge load of wood that he's dropped off for the ark, and Evan starts talking about, well, I have plans for this, and God starts laughing. You've got plans. I think sometimes that's a great picture for what God probably is doing. His plans are so much bigger and greater for us than we probably ever could imagine in this place. And we all can become extraordinary. That's the great, that's the greatest story about the Bible. Is that we are born, we can know God, and then He can turn us into something we could never become ourselves. And yeah, people can become extraordinary in the world's view by themselves. That's a truth. You know, Michael Jordan became great in the world's view because he worked really hard at basketball. You know, we lift up all these people, and I don't know where Michael Jordan's relationship is with Jesus. So please, I'm not making a judgment on him personally. Just saying, I'm talking about being made extraordinary through God. Doing something positive for the world because of what God has given us. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. As the worship team comes... I just want to challenge you guys this morning as we're going to go into a time of ministry my challenge to you is that you would just ask the lord ask the lord what his plan is for you that's the greatest thing about jesus he will answer our questions if we will just still our heart and ask the questions ask if you're somebody today who's who doesn't know what the lord wants from them and you want to know then ask Ask. Be willing to dream big. Be willing to dream big with the Lord. Understand that He can do big things. He made fishermen into famous individuals in the known world at that time. And now their names have lived on for thousands of years based on what Jesus had done through them and for them. So my challenge today is as we've heard these stories, we've heard these stories of the ordinary becoming extraordinary that we would allow them to have an impact in our personal lives, that we would begin to ask those questions about ourselves. What is it that I want from this world, in this life? What is it that Jesus wants from me in this life? And then being willing to have the courage to stand up and do something with it. That may mean getting up and coming to the cross this morning and getting on your face before the Lord. That may mean um, giving things up in our life. You know, Peter, James, and John had to give up who they were at that time to become who they were meant to be. I'm not saying that God's going to ask you to quit your job or move or any of those things, but He may. He may need you to quit some of the things you're doing to give you some of the things He wants you to be able to have. So I just invite you today as we sing... And we worship the Lord just to pursue Him. 
Ask those questions. Be willing to run after God this morning in this place. And then to see what he will do in your life after. Yes.